G'day folks and welcome to the last of six video tutorials on chemical thermodynamics. I use the term chemical thermodynamics because it's one of those areas which is, you know, physics have their own sort of idea of thermodynamics. Um, they're probably more often talking about pistons and work and stuff like that. You know, we, we really more function on the chemistry, chemical reactions, and that brings us to ideas such as the enthalpy of a chemical reaction, the change in the entropy of a chemical reaction, and so on. So talk about chemical thermodynamics. We've already covered a fair bit in the last five video tutorials, introduced all the important terminology, discussed the first and second laws of thermodynamics, introduced calorimetry, and investigated the Gibbs free energy. To finish, let's have a look at the relationship between the Gibbs free energy and the equilibrium constant K. And this brings in one final equation for you guys in the thermodynamics topic, and that is the reaction isotherm. The reaction isotherm represents the relationship between the change in the standard Gibbs free energy for a reaction and the equilibrium constant K. And so you can see in this formula in green on the left hand side we have the change in the Gibbs free energy of a reaction and it's equal to the negative of RT multiplied by the natural log of the equilibrium constant K. So this you might also know as KC. <laughs> C. So you guys um, will read various textbooks over time and so on, and you'll often see K or you'll see K. So it's the same thing, okay? So don't get any, uh, don't let there be no confusion about that. You can, of course, rearrange this equation depending on what it is you're trying to solve for. So you might have the equilibrium constant, and you're looking for delta G naught for the reaction, in which case you would use this equation here. It might be that you actually already have delta G naught, and you're trying to use that to determine the value of the equilibrium constant, so you would use that equation there. I should point out that if you're studying thermodynamics before, you'd, before you've studied the chemical equilibrium topic, this connection may not be so obvious to you. So um, that's just a warning for those of you out there who are who are studying um, thermo before equilibria. But hopefully it'll all become part of the bigger picture for you soon. To, so to sum it all up, we can sort of have a sliding scale like this where you can actually compare values for delta G naught to the equilibrium constant K. And you can see that if you have a very large value so a very non-spontaneous uh, reaction, I suppose, in the standard state uh, for delta G naught, you're actually going to have a really small value for K. In other words, essentially no forward reaction is taking place. The reverse reaction has pretty much gone to completion, is another way of saying that. If you have uh, a value which is sort of this arrow I think is, is a bit dodgy, it should be sort of pointing to here. Uh, if you have a, a delta G naught of value of zero, that means the equilibrium constant basically is one, and you have equal proportion of products and reactants at equilibrium. So your forward and reverse reactions proceed to the same extent. This is a really you know, unlikely scenario that you have exactly the same number of products as you have reactants, okay? It might seem like you have reached balance, and that's one of those classic terms which is misused in this topic. When something is at equilibrium, you're not saying that it's balanced. You're saying that it's that it's reached equilibrium. That's a different kind of idea, so don't confuse equilibrium with balance. Anyway, if you have a very low value for delta G naught, so you feel like you have a very spontaneous process, uh, then you can also say the forward reaction goes pretty much to completion. So you can see for very large values of, um, or I should say very large negative values of delta G naught, you have very large values for K. In other words, you have lots of products and not many reactants left. Here's an example question. Uh, what have we got? We've got methanol reacts with carbon monoxide to give acetic acid. And the question says, use the tabulated data to answer the question. The initial concentration 
of methanol is um, 0.5 molar, initial concentration of carbon monoxide is 2 molar, and you don't have any acetic acid initially, what's the concentration of acetic acid at equilibrium? And notice in the question, you're not given a value for the equilibrium constant at all. In other words, you have to use the delta G naught of formation values to determine the delta G naught for the reaction, which you can then sub into the reaction isotherm equation. And the equation we would have to use would be the blue one here, of course, because you would be solving uh, to find K. So the first step would be to calculate delta G naught for the reaction. And so you would take the delta G naught of the products and you would subtract from that the delta G naught of the reactants and put that into your equation there. And you would find that you get a value of minus 54.3 kilojoules per mole. You could then sub that into your equation and, hey, careful, look at this number. There's a minus there compared to this number here. Conversion people. Okay, when you use the reaction isotherm, your energy term must be in joules. Absolutely must be. Can't be in kilojoules per mole. Happy with that? Good. So... Uh, you can then go ahead and solve the usual equilibrium problem. I'm not going to solve the, 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 the final problem here. I, I think that's not really necessary. Look how big this number is. It's huge. Does that sort of, what does that imply to you? Um, it implies that this reaction pretty much goes to completion. Okay, so pretty much all of your methanol and carbon monoxide uh, in uh, with respect to the limiting reagent, which was, I think, the methanol, uh, has, has gone to completion. So if we go back a few slides, we saw, uh, okay, so our delta G naught value was kind of around here, which implied we should have got a K value sort of close to that. And and we did. We got a sort of a, a 10 to the neg 9, which is you know pretty similar to what we see there. Um, so does the very large value for K seem reasonable? Yeah, it does. When delta G naught for the reaction is large and negative, the reaction is very favorable. So guys, that's the reaction isotherm, and that's the last I'm going to talk about thermodynamics in these video tutorials. I hope these examples have been helpful.